just today. We have Superintendent. And the governor, senior policy advisor, one of our favorite sons of West Farm. Another school board member. Dana? Yeah, another school board member. Thank you. Uh, I also would like to thank the uh, Chamber of Commerce for helping us sponsor this. <coughs> Parsons, uh, another West Fargo resident, is uh, vice president of the chamber, and he's here from Mark Lemur, of course, is the business manager. And uh, we always do this joint thing between the city of West Fargo, the West Fargo School District, and the Chamber of Commerce. So we're all uh, very pleased that you could join us today on this very, very snowy day. With that, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today, uh, chief question asker, and uh, keep the timekeeper, and all of that good thing. Yeah, we'll get started. Yes. Thank you, Bernie. Uh, and thank you to the Chamber and the City of West Fargo for supporting the West Fargo School District. Um, we don't have, I don't have a microphone today, so I will be uh, actually going up to the podium and going to asking questions because all of this is uh, recorded and done uh, public access. Uh, many of you I, I recognize that have been here before and, and know how this process works, um, but uh, the biggest thing is that I need your questions. <coughs> Said, I, I'm the one that asked those questions. The reason I am up here as a moderator asking those questions is many times we get the same question or it's a variant of the same question. Um, and, and many times we, we just simply don't have enough time to get all the questions asked. Uh, but uh, the goal is, is to get um, as many questions from the West Fargo area here uh, asked of our legislators who have been kind enough to uh, come up on a, a, a weekend that they don't have that many of. process is that I'll ask a question. Uh, one of our, our legislators will, um, will be the primary person answering that. Uh, they'll have three minutes to answer that question. Um, and then if there are additional legislators after that, they will have, uh, they will have 90 seconds uh, to answer the question if they, they also have some input on it. Um, and then uh, once we get past the, the first uh, two legislators that, that talk after that, then at that point we would just be uh, <coughs> Thank you, Chris, and thanks everybody for attending here on this uh, snowy morning. My name is uh, Michael Howe, State Representative from District 22. Uh, that encompasses the neighborhoods of Eagle Run, Osgood, Deer Creek, uh, Horace, and then a, a lot of rural Cass County, Castleton, Arthur, uh, Leonard, Kinder, Davenport. Um, I serve on the Appropriations Committee. This is my first session on that committee. Uh, this is my second session overall. I was just elected in, in 2016. Uh, some of the things I've been working on, uh, I was a co-sponsor of House Bill 1066, which was the Operation Prairie Dog, which brings uh, much needed infrastructure funding uh, to growing communities like West Fargo and Horace and Castleton. Uh, and I'm also working on uh, Senate Bill 2297 with my colleague from District 45, uh, Ron Sorvag, there to provide some, some much needed funds for a couple of building projects at North Dakota State University 
as well as at Valley City State University and Dickinson State. But uh, uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Representative Shower. I think you still have 15 seconds left. <laughs> uh, Austin Shower, uh, West Fargo, District 13, uh, north of the interstate. Kind of the elderly West Fargo, not old West Fargo. <clears throat> I'm on the Industry, Business, Labor, and Government and Veterans Affairs Committees, and it's been a, quite a challenge, and uh, I thank you for the opportunity to represent West Fargo. Uh, we work hard out there. Uh, we had a constituent uh, contact me the other day and said, can your staff uh, make some copies of this? And I uh, we don't have a staff, but <laughs> maybe I can do it myself, which I did. Um, it has been a challenge. Uh, it's like the, when you walk into a school for the first time, you move schools, and then you walk into the uh, cafeteria. Where do you sit? Because you don't know very many people. But you work hard, and you get to know people, and uh, you do the very best that you can do. I'm working on five different bills. Um, um, two in particular have to do with um, minimum mandatory um, punishment sentences for child abusers. And that comes up in committee tomorrow afternoon, and we're going to fight and fight hard for that. We got it through the House committee, thanks to this man to my right. We got it through the House, and then we're going to get it through the Senate as best we can. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Representative Schauer. Uh, next is Representative Kim Koppelman, and I was lucky enough to get a microphone, so um, <laughs> hopefully I don't have to get up in front of everybody and get in the way. So, Representative Kim Koppelman. Good morning. Uh, my name is Kim Koppelman. I represent District 13, along with Representative Schauer, and I did show him where to sit. It was the <laughs> seat right next to me that over the years had been warmed by the likes of uh, Representatives Alan Wheeland and Christopher Olson and some others who had served our district very well over time. Um, I've been in the legislature since 1994 representing District 13 and to illustrate the, the growth of our community years ago when we'd have a forum like this for West Fargo legislators there were three of us, two representatives and one senator and uh, as our population has grown sometimes our geography and our districts has had to shrink but more districts have been added on and had other pieces of the community. District 13 is the only district that encompasses that is all within the city of West Fargo. Um, many districts have other portions of the city and pieces of the school district as many of my colleagues up here uh, represent. Uh, I chaired the Judiciary Committee and have served on that committee for most of my time in the legislature with the exception of four years when I was in the Appropriations Committee. I also serve on another committee that I've been uh, a member of the same length of time and that's the Political Subdivisions Committee and that deals with local units of government like school districts, cities, townships, uh, that sort of thing. Good to be here with you again today, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you, Representative Kim Koppelman. Next is Representative Ben Koppelman. Um, hello, everybody. I, uh, Representative Ben Koppelman, I serve District 16, which is the uh, east and south parts of West Fargo and, and a portion of Fargo. Um, I serve on the Government and Veterans Affairs Committee as well as the Finance and Taxation Committee. And uh, this session, we've uh, had an interesting run of it. We've um, had uh, the Prairie Dog Bill that was previously mentioned come through our, our committee in finance and tax. We've discussed things like reducing income tax and other um, maybe good and bad ideas that, uh, that have come through the committees and hopefully we've uh, forwarded on the good ones. But uh, individually I've worked on several bills. One that I would like to highlight is uh, House Bill 1520 which is also been called Natalie's Bill which is uh, a bill that really um, looks for reforms in our uh, juvenile justice system to ensure that uh, um, we have a consistent application of the law and that we um, provide the, the proper punishment and rehabilitation um, when necessary. So I look forward to your questions today. Thank you, Representative Ben Koppelman. Next is Representative Marshall. Thank you. I'm uh, Andrew Marshall. I'm uh, District 16. I'm with uh, Ben Koppelman, uh, comprising of, uh, I live in the Fargo portion of uh, District 16. I sit on the uh, Energy and Natural Resources Committee and the Education Committee. Um, we've got quite a few bills that have come through for both on the House and the Senate side. We're currently looking at uh, Senate bills that have come over. Um, we've dealt with uh, uh, the education, uh, higher ed, and that kind of things. Um, on the energy side, we deal with uh, uh, energy, uh, power production, anything that deals with um, coal power, wind power, and uh, both uh, and hunting and, and fishing type uh, bills. Thank you, Representative Marshall. Next is Senator Sorbach. Uh, first of all, thank you for having the forum today. Uh, my name is Ron Sorbach. I'm the state senator, District 45. District 45 is the uh, very north end of Fargo. 
the very north end of West Fargo, everything north of Maine here, except where Kim lives. <laughs> and, uh, and then we go out to Gardner, North Dakota. So we take in a lot of the rural Cass County, too. And then to uh, mix it all up, we also have NDSU campus. So I have a lot of unique demographics in District 45. This is my fifth session, my third term in the Senate. This will be my third session on appropriations in the Senate. And the uh, main things I've been involved with, as Representative Howe said, 2297, that's a bonding bill for higher ed and one of the ex couple extension buildings. We're going to have that in front of that committee Monday, Mike's committee, so I'm looking forward to that. And another one I've been really involved with larger is uh, 2282. And that is uh, a research bill using legacy earnings. Not the uh, thing, but the earnings. So that's one of the major. And the other thing, I know my time's up, but I just want to talk, is I'm also on the subcommittee for water on appropriations in the Senate. And that's now over on the House side, but that's obviously extremely critical to our area, and we've got a lot of work to do on it. Yes. But thank you. Thank you, Senator Sorbog. Next is Senator Kristen Roars. Thank you. Uh, again, like you said, my name is Kristen Roars. I live in South Fargo and am a nurse in town and I'm now this is my first session as a senator and so just learning how to drink from a fire hose is what I learned so far uh, and I sit on human services so dealing with all social services and health related things uh, as well as uh, government and veterans affairs which deals with anything veterans anything kind of interdepartmental within the state government um, and then for fun, we get to do all of the betting bills, all the charity gambling, anything like that. So um, that's been very entertaining this year, as well as any changes to the way we do initiated and constitutional measures. Um, and so we've had quite a few uh, pretty high profile hearings so far, and I'm really enjoying my time so far. Thank you, Senator Roars. All right, our first question um, is uh, uh, probably a good place to start since most of our questions today have, uh, have issues with um, appropriations and, and dollars. Um, so the, the question is, please provide an update as to uh, the, the status of the budget um, at, uh, at Crossover uh, and any kind of an, uh, a sneak peek, if you will, as to the revenue forecasts that uh, are expected to be coming out fairly shortly. So um, I'm not sure who best uh, to answer that, but uh, um, I would, I would be glad to start out. <laughs> well, the status of the budget at Crossover is always an ugly thing because it's in the negative. Um, traditionally, five to eight hundred million, and we, we did that again. So when I say in the negative, we're we're eighty, we were eight hundred and eighty-two million upside down. But that doesn't mean we have to cut eight hundred and eighty-two million, or we have to generate more revenue. It's just how the it's the general fund part of it. There's special funds to feed it. But uh, it, it, I'm going to use the term we use. The first half on budgets, and it's no different in the House, Senate, is we're setting the table because we have to wait for this new revenue forecast. And Monday will be Moody's. That's the uh, normal people that have provided revenue forecasts, more tied to the governor's and OMB office. And uh, about a year and a half ago, the legislature decided to hire another firm, IAH, IHS, to do a revenue forecast. And we will be hearing their forecast on Tuesday. And then at that point, I'm guessing Wednesday probably, you will hear the, we will determine the final numbers that we're going to use. And then that's where we go in and really finish these budgets. So they're in, uh, they're actually in pretty good shape. There's a lot of work to do, but there always is. It's, uh, we set the table, they do, we do our thing with now after the revenue forecasts and then we'll conference committee. But, there is a, definitely an increase in spending, but the revenues aren't uh, through the ceiling either, and we'll have to see how it works out, especially on the special projects, because that, a lot of them, like water, for example, it relies totally on the resources trust fund, one fund, and we'll have to see how that number is. It's probably going to be higher than it was, but I really have no idea at this time where it'll be at. Thank you, Senator Sorbach. Uh, Representative Howell. Uh, I, and I can add to Senator Sorbach's uh, answer there from a house perspective um, the house took a position this first half for state state employee benefits uh, as a two percent increase in the first year and a and a two percent increase in the second year uh, the Senate they did a two percent the first year and then a three percent in the second year so this this uh, uh, budget forecast on Monday 
will uh, help us determine will we go with a two and a three or a two and a two. Uh, last biennium, our state employees did not get a, a raise at all, and, and it's I think it's a consensus amongst all of us legislators that uh, state employees they they do need uh, an increase uh, in, in benefits and salary. This this uh, this biennium and will certainly work work to do that. Representative Howell. Anybody else have uh, uh, anything to add with respect to yeah, Representative Shower? Um, the West, Tex West Texas crude is at $56.07, and I've been told by Representative Howell that is usually what our price is about $68 from that price, so that's a good sign there, about $48. I know that's uh, at least it's going in the right direction. And then on the state employees, too, um, it looks like that uh, the state's going to pick up full health care benefits, which is about $186 a month. And correct me if I'm wrong, was that about $43 million increase for the state of North Dakota? So that looks good, too, for the state employees, that they won't be adding any, any, any more for their state health insurance, for, for their health insurance. Representative Schauer, anyone else? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, there had been mentioned previously about uh, Operation Prairie Dog, um, and I think it would be helpful to explain exactly what that is um, and how that would impact uh, the communities of West Fargo, Horace, um, and Harwood, um, and, and what types of, of projects could be completed with those dollars. Uh, and then also an indication uh, from each as to um, uh, what the, the prospectus is of Operation Prairie Dog passing uh, as it appears to be before the Appropriations Committee this week uh, and there's a, uh, some question as to uh, what the recommendation out of, out of committee will, will likely be and, and how that will be dealt with moving forward. So, uh, Representative Howe, I know that you are uh, a sponsor of that. Maybe you're a, a good place to start with that. Yeah, I can certainly do that, Chris. Uh, House Bill 1066 passed the House uh, with flying colors, now it's over in the, in the, in the Senate. Uh, it creates a new what we call buckets in the oil fund. Uh, this will provide infrastructure funding for counties, cities, and townships. Uh, and there is a formula there to, to determine how much a political subdivision could get based on their current population, uh, their growth rate, and things like that. Uh, as far as the, the prospectus of, of it passing through the Senate, I know uh, the majority there, Rich Wardner, had a, had a very strong influence on this bill, so I'd imagine it wouldn't have too much trouble uh, getting through the Senate. But I know, uh, especially in, in my area, where we are seeing such tremendous growth and have for the past decade, uh, I know the city of Horace, a lot of their infrastructure dates back to the 50s and 60s. Uh, and that's a community, as we've all seen, of course, the, the construction, building permits, uh, they're going to need new infrastructure and also updates to existing infrastructure as well. Um, it, it, it's, it's something that I feel is, is a huge priority that coming out of this legislative session, and, and I feel very confident it will get passed. Thank you, Representative Howell. Uh, any further comments with respect to the Prairie Dog Bill? Representative Kim Koppel? Thank you. Uh, Chris, just a, a, a broad perspective, you know, really what this bill has to do with is uh, how we divide state resources, and this happens to deal with oil resources, oil tax money, but um, over the years there's always been a little bit of a, of a parochialism and regional tug and pull in the legislature, and that's probably uh, reared its head most recently with what are called hub cities funding uh, over the recent sessions where oil revenue that has come from the western part of our state, we don't have any oil wells here in West Fargo or in, in our uh, part of the state, uh, there's been a sense, especially among western legislators, that this is our resource, we ought to have it here, and they've needed a lot of it, <clears throat> excuse me, and we've really supported that because they've needed infrastructure, have to build roads and do other things to support the oil industry and the growth that it's caused in that part of the state. Uh, now, many believe it's time to start spreading that revenue more broadly across the state, and that's where this funding for local political subdivisions comes in, and it is really important. Uh, you know, the flip side of that story is that for years, the uh, lion's share of the sales tax revenue came from Cass County, and yet the entire state benefited from that. So balancing is what this is really all about, and that's important, and I, I certainly supported the bill in the House. Thank you, Representative Kim Koppelman. Any further comments with respect to the Prairie Dog? I, I could just add, we're going to hear it Monday, but we haven't dealt with the bill at all. But uh, it has been positive. Our leadership name on the bill doesn't always mean it passes in the Senate, but it does help. But no, it, I just want to, uh, what <coughs> Representative Koppelman, too, 
This bill, if you look at the primary sponsors, where this initiated, it was those out west. And uh, we got a little pushback through the years. And so much money was going west, not coming east with this oil boom. But we had to do that. And, and we were always told, and I know Tim's been here a lot, you know, that you're, there's going to be a time. And that's what this bill is about. It's time to say some of those resources have to come for infrastructure to the non-oil producing counties. And, and like I said, it, it, the original started with those Western saying, now it's time to put some of those funds down there. We're in good shape. They need work. So it is an important bill, and I think that's why there's support there. And it, it's true infrastructure. And I just have, did you ask about a second Perry dog in that question, or did I hear that wrong? Uh, no, I don't, I don't believe Okay, that. because there, there is another one, and we'll maybe talk about that later. Uh, that, that might be a good transition into uh, what a, a second prairie dog may be. So, <laughs> <laughs> Senator Sorbog, if you, if you care to... Well, I don't know if it's called prairie. It depends what chamber you're in, but our leader likes to call that because he's behind this one. And uh, and I'm, I don't know if you've heard it at all over there, but it's, uh, it's a $450 million revolving loan infrastructure fund. It, uh, it doesn't limit it. If you look at the original Perry Dog, it limits it to streets, sewers, it can't be water projects, this and that. And I can't even think of the bill number off the top of my head. Only 275. Okay. And uh, thank you. And what it does is it, it's out there. It can be higher ed can use it only for streets and sewers infrastructure. Water projects can be done with it. And, and there is other infrastructure. But this is a loan. They'll, but that $450 million revolving loan. But what is important about it is that is going to be subsidized with $55 million a year of legacy earnings. Why is it? It's a loan from the Bank of North Dakota. They'll sell the bonds. They'll borrow it out. But they'll borrow it out at 2% interest to all these different groups. So it's a critical part of the puzzle, too. Now, I don't know if it's going to make it all through or make it through at those numbers. But again, it's trying to get money out, get it out affordable, get it done, and do it, and using some of the legacy earnings to subsidize some of that infrastructure and so, uh, I, like I said, I don't know where it is in the House, but it, han it passed very easily in the Senate, and uh, it's another part of the infrastructure bills that we're working with in the legislature this session. Thank you, Senator Sorbach. Anybody else with uh, comments as to the... Um Just on the Prairie Dog, it's $230 million. I don't know if we mentioned that for non-oil cities, counties, and townships. So that's great for us. And that also is $20 million for Airport Infrastructure Fund. So that also is good for Eastern North Dakota, us. Any further comments with respect to uh, uh, the Prairie Dog um, bills yeah. going through uh, both chambers? Uh, sticking with infrastructure and funding of that, uh, there are several questions here about the funding of the FM diversion. Uh, there has been um, news that there's an additional $300 million needed from the state. Uh, the Senate sent over an increase of only $100, $130 million, and that's over the course of uh, four to five bienniums. Um, so the question is, uh, do you support the, the full $300 million additional funding of the uh, of the FM diversion, um, and, and where would those funds come from uh, following the, uh, the, the offer or, or the, uh, the proposal coming over from the Senate uh, at 130 uh, over a, a fairly long period of time? Representative Ben Coppola? Um, thank you, Chris. Uh, although I'm not in the Appropriations Committee that is going to be hearing that, what I believe is in the water budget, um, in conceptually, I think the most important thing that we see in this biennium is an intent, an, you know, legislative intent that creates the commitment long term that the legislature has toward um, flood protection for the Fargo area. And I think if we look at what the uh, state commitment was toward other projects, other uh, water flood control projects, whether they be in Wapaton or Minot or Lisbon or other uh, cities, um, those have all been far north of 50%, some of them closer to 80%. And I think in the current um, numbers that I've been seeing, um, if the legislature was to commit the dollars that are being asked to them, I believe it would put the legislative um, or the state commitment on that to somewhere still under 40%. Um, so I, I think that's important that we make that commitment. Um, where the money comes from this biennium or next biennium, I guess I kind of have to leave that to the Appropriations Committee because they have to look at at um, what the revenue coming into those uh, strategic <laughs> funds is. But I think it is important that the legislature makes that long-term commitment that they'll be a partner, and I do believe that they have and will continue uh, to, to 
to, to be a positive partner in that project. Thank you, Representative Ben Kaufman. Well, I should speak on this one, and I won't speak for a couple questions, so hopefully, because um, I am on the water subcommittee, and it was my amendment that added $133 million. And I, I think it's just to explain what that is. It, it, as Representative Kaufman, it's intent, intent to the future. We can't buy in absolute, just like a city commission can't bind the next commission, but, but usually we respect legislative intent. And what this 133 had added, two more bienniums to the backside. We had three more of the 66 and a half. This puts it out two more. Does it get there? No, it doesn't get close, but we have to look at what we can get through the chamber too. And it was a reasonable to keep the discussion going. But to get the additional 100 million that the governor had in his budget, and that's requested, uh, that's a that's a big hurdle. It's really hard. Where's that money going to come from? And if it is going to come from, it's only can come from one place. We have to take it from somebody else. And um, I've been on the water budget for a while now. I've been on water topics, and it is one where we try to spread the the load around. Yes, we're not close to the 50 percent that we have done in other sessions or other areas. But you got to also understand this is the largest infrastructure project there's ever been in the state of North Dakota. $2.75 billion is a lot of money. There's been nothing close to that. So I'm hoping whether it's through this revolving loan that's available to water at a discounted rate, whether in future we have more money, and that was the idea of adding this, is to put a commitment that we're going to work with it. but. Right now, unless there's some amazing numbers coming up in Monday or Tuesday, there's not going to be the funds to do that unless we take it from other projects. And at the end of the day, you have to have over half the votes. And that's why there's 141 legislatures and there's water projects everywhere. So it's still open. I know Representative Howe, they just heard it over there. And we've still got a lot of work to do. And uh, so I hope, but it, it was a start. It was to keep the discussion alive, and it is an attempt. We want to work with this project. So, anyhow. I just want to add one thing. I know there's a, a group of Cass County legislators that have started to meet. I think we've only met one time so far, but really to keep the conversation going amongst all the Cass County legislators to make sure that we're all receiving the same information, uh, having good understanding of where the diversion stands and other issues, but I would say the diversion is was the primary focus of that first meeting and to um, to really make sure that we, we are moving this forward in the way that we need to. We know that most water projects in the state of North Dakota have been funded at close to about 60%, and this one would be a little bit closer to 30% uh, state funding. But as Senator Sarbog said, when you start with such a large number, uh, that 60% would be a, a pretty large haul when you need to get that many votes. And so um, we want to make sure that we can make this happen. We know that the amount of snow that we've gotten this year and continue to get today are not helping the, the, the uh, flood outlook. Representative uh, Kim Coughlin. Son? Not sure which way I'm pushing this. There, you go. Um, <laughs> there we go. Okay. Uh, well, as one uh, famous, uh, long-time departed the U.S. senator used to say, "A billion here, a billion there. Pretty soon, you're talking real money." And uh, th but this is a very important project. I don't want to repeat what's been said. It's, it's all been good information. But just to add that the reason the legislative intent language, as I understand it, is critically important this session is mainly for financing. It's, it's less important what that dollar number is probably at the end, but that the, those who are going to finance this project know that the North Dakota legislature is behind it and is committed to it. And even, as has been said, one legislative session cannot commit the next. Um, it still lays the groundwork uh, for the commitment of the state and that that's expected. Thank you, Representative Kim Koppelman. I believe uh, Representative Howe, you had... Uh, yeah, just, just real quickly I can add, um, and Senator Schwabach, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there was about $700 million of water projects that were asked for for this, for this the legislative session. Um, without a doubt, I think everyone agrees that we need funding for the FM diversion in some form. Um, but again, the, as it's been pointed out, there's 141 of us that represent all different areas of the state. And to come to a consensus of you know, who's on the chopping block, uh, We'll have some interesting conversations, that's that's for sure, uh, in the coming weeks. Representative Howe, any further comments? 
Well, I do have some concerns over the diversion. Uh, I think we in Fargo, Mor Fargo Morid and West Fargo, we need it. There's no question about that. Maybe there's some other areas that we could have been differently, but that's that's the way it goes. But uh, there's a term called stranded money, and what I'm hearing from some people out, some legislators out there, is why put money into a project that may never happen? And uh, the city of Fargo needs to um, get on its horse and get out to Bismarck every single day and be lobbying hard for this project or it runs the risk of falling apart. There can be no assumption. We're 200 miles away from Bismarck, and it's a different attitude in this community than it is in Bismarck concerning water and water projects and water protection. So if we're not on top of our game, and as Senator Roars mentioned, we met for the first time on this, first time as legislators, and some people don't even like caucuses. So we better make sure that our act is together, or there's, there could be some issues with the diversion. I'm, I'm concerned. Any further comments with respect to diversion funding? Great. Uh, the next question, um, uh, again, with respect to appropriations, um, but uh, uh, switching gears from infrastructure to education, um, there was a uh, uh, some some um, there was a delayed bill 2362 out there with respect to uh, uh, allocation of funding, um, and there is some question as to whether the uh, and, and some articles in the paper about uh, uh, K through 12 funds being um, appropriated into a, a different uh, fund compared to what was expected. Um, if we can get an update as to that, and then also uh, whether there is support to to reallocate that into the education uh, funding. Can I just make sure I'm understanding? I don't have my to pull up 2362, but uh, you said 2362. Yes, that's correct. So if I remember right, is this the one where just the other day they the news came out about um, the the school trust funds some, that believe being allocated to the general Misunderstanding of where the the between the different parts of code where the money should be going versus the other. So I'm doing that more to prompt him to answer the question than <laughs> to actually tell you anything. Well, I can tell you what I know. There was um, a different interpretation of how the law, the Attorney General made, but how the funds were be distributing. Uh, coming off the, some of the tribal and whether the extraction tax, where it should go. But at the end of the day, it basically amounts to about, and I can't remember the number, to about 150, I think, or excuse me, 58 million, I think, to the Common School Trust Fund that was shorted, 58 million to the Foundation Aid Stabilization, and probably about 120 to the uh, Resources Trust. Over, the Resource Trust one is a little more iffy, the other two, but the Treasurer did it, no one did wrong by the interpretation of the Attorney General. Now they're looking at it different, and there's two sides. The new head of the land and trust says it should be the other way around. So what this bill is looking at is to change the language so that it'll be very clear how it's done in the future. Now I think it, it needs to be understood like the common school trust fund. It isn't we, we're using, uh, and I think it's about 300 million of our 250 earnings that I'm looking out there because he'd know better than me. But uh, whatever the number, we use the earnings out of the common school trust or the interest it earns. This would not be 58 million in one year. It would go into the huge principle with the other two and a half billion. So it's a, it's a tiny part when you say you're short at education. And the foundation aid stabilization fund, and all of these, we haven't shorted one fund that goes to education. We've covered it some other way. So the, the funding has been the same. But right now there's work on the language. The question, the real question out there is do we pay back and if we do, then we got to figure out where another $200 million. Do we pay those funds back? Or do we pay them back in this biennium? Or do we do it over a multiple? So there's a lot of ifs out there. But it is a confusion. It was an interpretation of the way the law read. It had been questioned before, and there had been rulings. It's questioned again. And I think there's, this bill has a legislative or intent language of how it should be done. It cleans it up. But the real question is going to be, because I presume the House will go with that too, do we pay that back? And that discussion's still happening. And I know that sounds confusing, but this dropped in just on us the other day, too. Thank you, uh, Senator Sorbog. Next is Representative Kim Kaufman, I believe. Well, just a note, uh, it is scheduled for a committee hearing according to the uh, schedule on the 13th, which is next Wednesday, in the Finance and Tax Committee. And I assume, since it's a Senate bill, it would go to the Senate Finance and Tax at that time. 
Thank you. Any further comments with respect to um, the reallocation of funds from the uh, school trust fund? Right. Um, next question is about uh, Senate Bill 2265. Uh, this is a, a very common question in the, the 10 or 12 years I've been doing these, uh, these forums about on-time school funding. Um, and there has been a, a goal uh, and, and a need in West Fargo uh, to get on-time school funding instead of a, a delay of a year. Uh, because as many of you know, uh, West Fargo has uh, the fastest growing school population um, in, in the state. Um, and that has, has varied slightly, but has always been a, on an upward trajectory. So um, uh, what is the status of 2265, and is there support this year to, to get on-time funding for, for schools? Well, we'll start with the fact that it passed unanimously out of the Senate, so we did our part. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hasn't been. Looks like it hasn't been scheduled for a committee hearing yet in the House. In it's the with your education, committee. but they haven't scheduled yeah, they a hearing yet. They haven't scheduled a hearing yet. Uh, 2265. Yep. So this is changing from that historical uh, census, for better, lack of better word, to on-time school funding. So this helps the high-growth schools the most. Well, and it, it, go, it goes into effect the second year of this biennium. But you will be paid on, whether you're up or down, you'll pay it on your student population. It's something that's been asked for a long time. It's a good move. But it, it's being, it, this bill held it off till the second year of the biennium for why we do a lot of things because of money. Because it, it's, a, I think it's additional 30 million that it's going to cost. So it's a lot of money. Thank you, Senator Sorbog, Representative Kip, uh, Ben Kaufman. Um, thank you, Chris. Um, I'm reading this correct. I think it does have some factors possibly for districts, unlike ours, that are shrinking. I think there might be some allowing for their paid on a different metric. So I think it's a little bit of a hybrid. For the districts that are growing, it makes the funding improved. The districts that are staying the same or shrinking, I think it has some of the elements of the former funding to not completely that leave them harmed. But this is a bill that several of us up here have, have sponsored in one way, shape, or form for numerous sessions. I know I spent two uh, sessions on the Education Committee. In both of those sessions, I sponsored legislation um, to try to go uh, to actually something that was similar to this. It was the, in my case, in my bill's case, it was the greater of the two options last year's or this year's. But um, I think it'd be a positive thing. Uh, I think Representative Marshall, it'll probably end up in his committee when it comes across because he's on education now. And uh, I certainly plan to support it when he hits the floor. Thank you, Representative Ben Kaufman, Representative Kim Kaufman. Thank you. And, and I concur with what's been said. It's uh, uh, and, and just a, a little a little bit of a note on this, it's been referred to as the historical standard. Actually, it wasn't. The historical standard in North Dakota, and those of us that have been around a while will remember this, this is the way we did things. When uh, when you counted noses in the fall, that's the, that's the number of students you got paid for in foundation aid from the state. In other words, the state funding for students in North Dakota. And that was always sort of a no-brainer. But what happened several years ago is that uh, before the oil boom, as a lot of our rural school districts particularly were starting to shrink, they said, you know, we're, we're having trouble just keeping the doors open. And so would you please fund us based on the number of students we have in the spring instead of the number of students we have in the fall? Because there are a few more in the spring as we're shrinking. It just helps keep us alive. And at the time, even our district said, you know, we should support this because we should take one for the team. We know it will maybe hurt us a little bit, but in, in the big picture, it's the right thing to do. So we did. Well, fast forward, all of a sudden, West Fargo started growing by four to 500 students a year. And uh, that's a whole different ballgame. That's bigger than the average school district in the state of North Dakota. And I used to tell my colleagues, well, what would you think if a new, if a new school district of 500 kids popped up in your legislative district this year? And the state said, this is how much money you're getting from us for those kids. If you put it in that context, I think people understand. So what's happened in the meantime is, is our fast-growing districts like ours have really languished and suffered uh, under this uh, funding formula. And so it really is time to change. There have been some tweaking, some little efforts with rapid enrollment and so on, but they really haven't fixed the problem. And I'm hoping this session, a bill like this, can begin to solve that. Thank you, Representative uh, Kim Koppelman, uh, Representative Howe, and then we'll follow up with uh, Representative Marshall. Um, you know, we all represent the West Fargo School District. Uh, district 22, where I represent, I think has eight or nine school districts in it. Uh, most of them are growing like West Fargo, not at the same rapid pace, but there are uh, a couple that uh, are decreasing in enrollment year after year. And uh, what little I know about the, the, the current bill, I, I need to do a little more homework on it. Um, 
it's encouraging to hear that there is a, a hybrid formula for it for uh, school districts that may be decreasing. Um, but certainly, I'll, I'll want to look into that. But it, it, went, it was unanimous through the Senate, so um, that's that is encouraging. Representative Powell, uh, Representative Marshall, uh, uh, as was indicated, probably will be coming through your committee here sometime soon. I've I've heard a little bit about th this bill. Um, I have not read it yet. Uh, but from the stuff I've heard, it's ver uh, encouraging, and um, tentatively, I'm, uh, I'm supporting it until I read the bill. That's why I say tentatively. Uh, I'm pretty confident I probably will be supporting it. Uh, it sounds, uh, from talking to other people, uh, really promising, because um, I know we've had, uh, from talking to the folks in West Fargo schools, uh, talking to legislators that have... Uh, 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 in the smaller school districts uh, around the state, um, something that has, uh, needs to be done. Um, we've done a lot of work in the past by helping it out. I think this is uh, going to go a long ways to alleviate a lot of the problems we've been having with the funding for schools. Thank you, Representative Marshall. Any further comments? Uh, shifting gears a little bit to higher education, uh, we'll, we'll ask a, a generic question at first, which is um, uh, what is the, the status of the higher education um, uh, budget as it's moving through uh, this year? And then uh, after we get a, an answer to the, to the general question, then uh, we do have some specific questions about, uh, about particular elements of that. So I'm um, not sure who would be the best to start with uh, higher education uh, budgeting uh, for this year, but uh, turn it over to you. I will defer because we don't hear it for another week and a half. We haven't even had the budget yet, so. Yeah, I, I, can, uh, I can start that out. The House did pass higher education budget in the first half. It, it's going over to the Senate. Um, you know, last session that was the big talk of higher education funding was slashed um, by a lot. And there's no way around it. Uh, this session, you know, the House added in a 2% increase for those salaries and, and benefits. Um, uh, funding, I know there's a, another research bill, a uh, bonding bill for $45 million in additional research, which is not uh, attached to the higher ed budget. Um, you know, I, I, I can't remember off the top of my head here of, of what that exact number was in the higher ed budget, but uh, it, it w wasn't anywhere near uh, of what we did to it last session, that's for sure. And, and that, that was, I think, a priority of mine as well to not. Uh, not cut because they, they took their, their fair share of a haircut last session. For the comments on the, the general question about uh, higher ed budgets. All right, uh, specific questions. Um, uh, Representative Howell mentioned the, the bonding for uh, um, university construction and then also um, uh, on top of that there is some, some discussion about using legacy funds for research. Uh, is there support for uh, for the bonding bill for university construction and also for um, using legacy funds for for research on higher education? Well, I, I can start that off. Uh, it certainly has my support. I know uh, the building projects, uh, you know, flew through the Senate. I believe the research bill did as well. Now, when we talked about when we're $800 million upside down in general fund money, uh, we're not going to get all our, all our projects and we understand that. Um, if I were to rank my priorities, I would probably put the building projects ahead of that additional research money. Uh, those building, that uh, Harris Hall project I think is extremely needed uh, for the ag industry. We talk about uh, energy and the, and the um, resources we've put behind that and, and energy uh, infrastructure, energy research. Uh, this does this for agriculture. Agriculture is having some tough times, as we all know, um, not just through commodity prices, but also uh, the United States is, is, seems to be going after uh, uh, you know, low-carb diets, and GMO uh, has been under attack a little bit. Uh, if that's the way our country is going to go, uh, I think North Dakota and our producers, we have to react accordingly. Uh, and this would be one way to do that, where we can still grow uh, the nation's best wheat crop, best barley, soybeans, corn, 
uh, and react to what the consumer demands and wants. And I feel if we have a state-of-the-art research building like this, uh, it will set up North Dakota very well for the future. Representative Howell. Representative Kim Koppelman. Thank you. And, and rather than responding to that specific request, I just want to respond in a larger uh, scope to the whole legacy <laughs> fund question and where, does the do where do the dollars go. And it's been very interesting to watch this because prior to chairing the Judiciary Committee, I chaired a committee called the Constitutional Revision Committee. And that committee, along with a subsequent conference committee between the House and the Senate, which I also chaired, crafted what we now know as the Legacy Fund, put it on the ballot, the people of North Dakota passed it. After rejecting a similar measure previously, we tweaked it a little bit, went to those that had opposed the measure and said, will you work with us? And we ended up with that on the ballot, which passed. That fund has almost $6 billion in it, as many of you know. And this is the first biennium for seven years that those dollars were locked up. This is the first time any of that money is spendable. Um, and it comes out, the, the proceeds, the interest, comes out now into the general fund. The principle stays, and the legislature can get at that in an emergency, but it requires a two-thirds vote of both chambers. So you can imagine, with that money coming out, everybody's got an idea for how to spend it. You know, And it's the old adage of, for every dollar there, there are ten hands out saying it's mine. Uh, we passed an interesting bill in the House uh, the other day, which, which contemplated something I hadn't, but I thought it's really intriguing to say, maybe we should leave the legacy fund interest to the same standard, and this would be a constitutional measure that the people would have to approve again, that we, that we have the principle attached to. In other words, two-thirds vote of the legislature. And it's interesting. We did pass it in the House. If it passes the Senate, it'll have to go for, for the people for a vote. But it would lock those funds up just a little more, not lock them up, but at least keep them a little bit more at bay unless there was something that was big enough that it would require a two-thirds vote of both chambers. And uh, I don't know, you know how you feel about that, but uh, you know, the governor's got ideas for this money. Um, the, we've heard about bills in the Senate already, and uh, there are all kinds of ideas out there, and it may be a time to step back and say, maybe we should uh, think a little harder about this. On the bonding bill, it passed unanimous in the Senate. It's $152 million, but it empties out the pipeline. We've got a clog up on higher ed buildings. It's $24 million a year of general funds, so it, it is very affordable. And that's why I think that had strong support. But I'm going to go a little to the research bill, because I'm the private sponsor. It's 2282. And we have $45 million of legacy earnings in there. And why is it legacy earnings? What is the research about? It's about our future. The Legacy Fund was put there so we wouldn't use all these resources of oil for the future generations and take it all and blow it today. And I do not support touching the principle at all. But the earnings, I think, and it's solely my opinion, if we are going to spend them, let's spend it on stuff that promotes the future. This research bill does it. Now, $45 million might be too high because there is another bill that was sent over from the House, 1333. And that, that's the other spectrum of research that uh, we will be hearing that Thursday in appropriations. And that's kind of a partner bill to this one that came out. So I, I just think uh, hopefully we keep open minds. There was a bill. We had that. We looked at that an interim, two, two interims ago of locking up these earnings. We rejected that where they would go directly into the principal. And, um, and the people put that in the Constitutional Amendment that we could now start using those earnings. We, we're budgeting 300 million. Potentially, it could be four to 500 million. But, like the legacy fund is going to be over 600 billion, even with us spending these earnings. There is 30 percent of the oil money is going into this legacy fund. So I don't think we're robbing it by looking at opportunities to spend it. But there's no question the debate is going: What do we spend it on if we're going to spend it? And that's what's going to have to be sorted out. The House had a different perspective than we did, and that's why we got a lot of process to go. So. Uh, Representative Ben Koppelman. Uh, thank, thank you. Yeah, uh, I think it was m mentioned that there's like there's about six billion in the uh, yeah. in the legacy fund, and that that the earnings this session are expected to be somewhere in the neighborhood of three to four hundred million. But I, I think the bigger question, um, and was previously mentioned about uh, a proposal in front of the voters, is should the le earnings in the legacy fund be used as a backfill in spending to the general fund? or should they be reserved only for special funds and not used as a backfill in the general fund? And I know that's been a concern for me. Um, I believe that what we do use legacy funds for 
um, it should be a, in an effort to benefit as many, if not all, North Dakotans with the projects that we do, whether that's um, reducing their tax burden in some way, whether that's um, um, providing some benefit that they can all um, enjoy in. So I, uh, I'm definitely supportive of, of um, taking a closer look at how we use those funds and not have them just be uh, considered part of our re revenue source. Representative Ben Kaufman, further comments with respect to uh, either bonding for higher education or use of legacy funds for education? Right. Uh, we have several questions regarding career and technology education and also uh, workforce academies. Um, does, does this group uh, support uh, additional funding for career and technology education and then also the, the uh, um, setup and, and funding of the workforce academies? Uh, and do you see funding for those projects moving forward um, through uh, whether that be uh, higher education or, or other funds available? Representative Ben Koffelman. Um, thank you, Chris. I am supportive of of um, kind of revamping our our efforts in education. I believe over the next uh, you know several decades, uh, education, higher education, is going to change dramatically. And I think if we uh, just look at those um, careers out there that ha are very well paying jobs, uh, many of them are not um, you know uh, four year degree type type jobs. They're technical jobs, they're jobs that oftentimes require either an apprenticeship or a certificate to get into as opposed to um, a degree and I think um, there's a little bit of a uh, balance going on right now in um, uh, our citizens valuing those jobs again at a high level equal to those that require a four-year degree and I think um, it's going to be important that we um, as as missions change and, and programs change that we um, fund those options to to provide uh, training academies and things so that um, our young people can go into the workforce into high paying jobs without being crippled by uh, student debt. Representative Ben Kaufman, uh, anyone else? Uh, Representative Kim Kaufman. Again, let me take a little higher level uh, approach to that question. I do support the innovation that's going on with things like the career and technical education focus and so on. Uh, but we passed a bill, a, a resolution actually on the House floor recently that came through the Judiciary Committee and it's, it's a similar resolution to one that the legislature passed in 1997 and the people in 1998 rejected and it contemplates removing the names and the missions of the institutions of higher education from our state's constitution. They've been there since the state was founded and many of them are arguably a little bit antiquated. I'm talking about the missions now, uh, what these schools will do and so on. And we see the innovation, we see the collaboration and some are questioning is it even constitutional? You know, we have uh, in the Constitution that there's supposed to be a certain type of school, basically a career and technology related school in Wapiton, North Dakota. We know it today as the North Dakota State College of Science. There's some question as to whether all the collaboration that school, for example, is doing here in the Fargo, West Fargo area with NDSU is even constitutional because those missions are pretty rigid. So there was a discussion in our committee, should we just remove the missions? and leave the locations because then you get into a parochial discussion. All the smaller communities that have colleges are worried that somebody's out to close their school and so on. That's what happened in 1998. And uh, the higher education looked at that and came back to us and said, well, you know, our, our uh, deputy uh, assistant attorney general thinks that it wouldn't really do much to remove the missions. So we should either, you know, they didn't advocate removing the schools, but they said it's really no benefit to only remove the missions. So the way it's moving from the House to the Senate, at least, it would uh, it would remove them all. And that, of course, would, again, have to go to a vote of the people because it's constitutional. But the question is, are we at a point, you know, uh, 150 years plus after we've become a state, to really take a look at this and say, or about that time, to say, uh, you know, do those, do those locations and missions really make sense and really need to be in the Constitution? And is the reason those schools exist only because they're named in the Constitution? Well, we have campuses, we have buildings, we have programs, we have uh, financing, so most people don't think so. And it'll be an interesting thing to uh, to uh, debate again, and if the if it does pass the Senate, and see if, see what the people think about it. I don't have strong feelings, but I think it's a good discussion to have. Thank you, Representative Kim Koppelman. Uh, Representative Schauer. 
I fully back the trades and the education surrounding the trades. Um, what I do now is I'm a headhunter. I deal with people all the time looking for jobs, and we try to find people jobs. And the trades jobs are unbelievable. HVAC and electricians and plumbing, it's through the roof. And we've had several bills come through our in, um, Industry Business and Labor Committee supporting CTE, and that's moving forward. And that's a really, really great sign. I am not high on the career academies. I think it's a trendy situation. I think it sounds good. But I would like to put those dollars and put them at, you know, West Fargo schools and build that career academy right there on the school site as opposed to putting it somewhere else and busting those kids somewhere else. Because these kids, generally speaking, are a little bit on the outside to begin with. And they could be right there on campus, expand the programs that we already have, and they still have the full high school um, experience. And we don't have to put them in a bus and take them over to Timbuktu and then be back. So I, that's just my own personal opinion. I know it sounds good. I know people are really into the career academies. I would like to see that money taken and put it in, into our own high school structures. Are there comments with respect to uh, career and technical education or uh, workforce academies? Representative Marshall. Um, well, currently, uh, prior to be, uh, being elected, I was working for a commercial construction company. And we see this uh, on a daily basis on some of the projects that we've been working on when we're having to collaborate with, with the different trades and uh, what we were doing. And um, they're really hurting quite a bit uh, trying to find uh, workforces. and. When I was growing up, when I was going through high school, yes, we did have uh, a central location for uh, the trades. Um, uh, Fargo North, uh, we had uh, we built homes and we and we built full-size garages and stuff like that. Uh, the major stuff, the automotive and welding, was down at South. Um, and as we grow and as we expand um, throughout the history. Um, the atmosphere is starting to change. Uh, we're starting to get into robotics, welding robotics, and uh, AutoCAD uh, when it comes to cutting things out and trying to get a leg up for our kids. Uh, my son recently, uh, a few years back, of course, graduated from uh, from North, and he, but he did most of his studies down at, at South through the different programs down there. And, and so I'm really uh, interested in trying to get whether it's going back to uh, expanding the schools or coming up with a career academy, we need to be able to um, uh, move with the times and, and go with where the, um, the technology is moving us. Thank you. Any further comments? Uh, Senator Thorbach? I'm just going to, you know, uh, we had the budget. We heard it. I'm not on that subcommittee. And I <clears throat> look at the governor's recommendation and and what the House did, it was all pretty close, except I think most of you realize there was $30 million in the governor's budget, and the House took it all out. So I'm hoping our committee, in conferencing with the House, because where we are at this point doesn't mean anything, that we can put some of that money back, because if we are going to do these career academies, if we're going to build to that, then we have to put that workforce grant money back in. But right now, it's not there, and uh, so I, I'm definitely very supportive. 30 million is maybe too high, but hopefully we can get some of that back in. But, but we also expect those academies to do a lot of local dollars, too. That's uh, Bismarck's the model, and uh, I think that's important. That, and our community has stepped up with quite a few millions as we work forward. But that's one of the big efforts that we really have to work on, is getting some of that workforce development grant money back. Thank you. Any further comments? Um, there are several questions regarding House Concurrent Resolution 3037, uh, which was identified as the Equal Rights Amendment, um, and, uh, and what the impact of the votes on, uh, on 3037 will have on the ability to, uh, to attract workers into the state of North Dakota uh, during a time of workforce shortage. Um, I know that made it before the House, and uh, uh, there's some questions as to uh, where and how it ends up where it is. So, uh, so Senator Roars? So not being in the House, but being the only female up here, <laughs> yeah. uh, I will say I was terribly disappointed in the uh, resolution and the way that the vote came out. Uh, first of all, from my understanding of it, it, that resolution actually does not accomplish anything. You can't rescind uh, a previously approved amendment 
whether it was ratified or not. And so um, on the day after the International Women's Day, I, I will tell you that that was a very disappointing uh, thing. I don't know that it necessarily changes our how we attract workforce, but it sure does give us some negative press. So. Thank you, Senator Roars. Uh, comments from some of the representatives uh, that, that heard this in the House? Uh, Representative Kim Koppelman. Well, I was not on the committee that, that heard that resolution. Uh, I, did, I did support it on the floor. And a little background, what that does is, in 1972, those of us that were around in 1972 might remember this, there was a thing called the Equal Rights Amendment. And it was a proposed amendment to the U.S. Constitution that uh, was put out to states to ratify. Uh, some thought it was a great idea, and on the, name, on the face of it, the, you know, the name sure sounds like it would be. I think we all support equal rights, regardless of gender, uh, you know, sex, uh, religion, etc. That's part of our Constitution already. Uh, but it got, uh, it fell a little bit short of the required 38 states, three-fourths of the states are what's required to ratify an amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Congress had put it out to the states for ratification, and they had set a window of time by which that ratification had to happen by that requisite number of states, and it fell short of that. So everybody thought it was over, it was a done deal. And what's happened recently is some groups have started to bring that idea back, saying, well, it's not over. And the states that have ratified it, if a few more states come on board, that's, that's all still valid, and if a few more states come on board, it becomes part of our Constitution. So that's been a debate. And uh, North Dakota, the, the measure that we passed simply said, we understand what Congress said, and that it was over when it was over, and uh, we're not part of this anymore. We voted to support it back in that time, but if you want an amendment like this, you probably have to bring a new one, because that's a done deal. Thank you, Representative King Koppelman. Any further comments with respect to uh, 3037? All right. Um, the final question, and um, we'll probably need some relatively short answers here so we can still get into our, our wrap-ups, um, but the, the governor has reached an agreement with the Manda and Tadatsa uh, Arikara tribe with respect to oil taxation, um, and uh, the question is whether there will be support from, uh, uh, from the legislators here in West Fargo for our Senate Bill 2312, uh, which puts that agreement into effect. Representative Ben Coughlin. Um Thank you, Chris. Uh, this, um, sorry, I was just pulling up the, make sure I had the right one here. Um, so 2312 is the um, bill that would essentially ratify <coughs> a new agreement between the tribes and the state on uh, oil wells that are located either on trust land or fee land within um, the confines of the reservation boundaries. And uh, it, on the on the uh, trust lands, it uses an 80% tribe, 20% to the state on on oil revenue, and then it's just the opposite on the uh, on the fee lands. It's 80% uh, to the state, 20% to the tribes. Currently, it's 50/50 for each, and uh, the tribe had felt that uh, that they didn't think that um, was fair, was adequate, and uh, that had led to some tension in the last uh, probably two or three years. Uh, the governor had. Uh, had reached out and worked with the tribes to come up with this this concept that was put into a bill, and I believe ultimately it'll pass the House Taxation Committee, uh, which I serve on as well as the uh, as well as the floor of the House. Um, it did already pass the Senate, since it's obviously a Senate bill. But uh, there is one concern that has come up that we're trying to work through, and that is that in the drafting of the bill, um, it strikes out the language that the legislature shall ratify an agreement that the governor has, has made with the tribes. Um, it also struck out a deadline of, or a, excuse me, a maximum number of years that those agreements can be in place. Um, I haven't heard where people sit on um, striking out the maximum number of years. I know personally I don't have an issue with that. But the fact that they struck out that the legislature shall ratify um, seemed concerning. In, in bringing that up to different individuals, I've been told, well, don't worry about it. The agreement that they... Um, came up with between the tribes and the governor says that the House and the Senate must ratify. And the problem is, is once that agreement reaches its life, and if a new agreement were going to be negotiated by a new governor and a new tribal chairman in the future, um, they may not choose to write that into the, uh, into the agreement. Um, the second thing I've heard is, well, don't worry, because the tax commissioner can only um, operate off of what's in century code. Um, and so 
uh, if you didn't change century code, even if there's a new agreement, it wouldn't have any teeth. Um, that may be true, but I don't see, or I'm not sure I've been convinced of why we should take out that out of law. And so there may be an amendment made in committee to still um, have the legislature ratify. It doesn't change the terms of the agreement um, and uh, probably will be of little consequence other than just for people to clearly understand that that is a function of the legislature, that any agreement that the executive branch reaches should be ratified. Thank you, Representative Ben Kaufman. Any further comments with respect to the uh, uh, tribal tax bill? Representative Kim Kaufman. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, I feel like the uh, legislative historian here on so many of these questions because these bills that have been asked about have not been in the committee I serve on in the legislature uh, this session. I have to look uh, look at the broad view and, and the sort of the historical perspective. I agree with uh, concerns that, that have been expressed about that particular bill. And uh, a little bit of history here. When the oil boom started happening in North Dakota, uh, there was a problem. There was oil on the reservation, but there was a problem uh, tapping it. And there was one oil well there, and the tribes came to the state of North Dakota because oil companies would not drill on the reservation because of tribal law. And they were afraid of uh, their investment not being protected <laughs> adequately by a set of laws they could depend upon. So they came to the state of North Dakota and said, will you put the full faith and credit of North Dakota behind this so we know we've got some, we know what the, what the, the, the rules of the game are and we'll be able to operate like we do in other places. We, we agreed to do that as a state. That by the next session, two years later, there were 300 oil wells on that reservation. And there was a split agreed to in uh, how the oil would be divided, the oil revenue, the tax revenue would be divided. And uh, a few years later, the tribes were happy, but they came back and said, well, we don't like the split anymore. We want more of that money. And I voted against that because I thought, you know, if you make a, you make a deal, your word should be good and, and your bargain should be kept. And, but it passed. We changed it. And they're back again. And so I'm not saying I won't support this because I haven't really looked at this bill yet and analyzed it, but I do have those concerns. And the numbers that I'm seeing are that it's a $33 million reduction in the state oil revenue. If we if we pass this, uh, so I'm, I'm going to look uh, very hard at it, but I do very much agree with the concern that's been raised because the legislative branch of government is the policy making branch of government. It's also the branch of government that holds the purse strings. So I think it's very dangerous if we take out of law the fact that these kinds of agreements have to be ratified by the legislature. Thank you, Representative King Kaufman, uh, Senator Zorbach. Uh, well. You know, on that policy part, that's what our finance tax committees can work it out. And But on the dollar amounts, it is around $30 million. But I, I think the important part of why we did that, or at least the, the language that came to us and why we supported it, is the fact it's trying to get stability in a long-term agreement. The, it, when we made the changes and some of the extraction tax rates took some of the others out, there's been discord. And the whole idea here is to get numbers that they can live with, we can live with. This, this was work. There was a lot of negotiation between our committee and the tribes. I know the governor's office was involved. But trying to find that long-term agreement, and it isn't just what money we get or what money they get. It's long-term. How do you get a stable, dependable agreement that the companies will do the investing that they have to do in there? Because we need that oil. That, that's a big piece of the oil play. And it's been good for North Dakota, it's been good for tri the tribes, and this is just trying to make it a little better. Like I said, if there's wording and language, I would hope the policy committees can come to agreements on that. But in the long term, to build a good, stable relation with a long-term agreement, this seemed like a good move. You know, it's like everything, we've got to go through two chambers. So hopefully if it takes tweaking, fine, but we can keep it together. Because I think for North Dakota in the long term and the tribes in the long term, it's a better deal. Thank you, Senator Sorbach. Um, to allow us to wrap up pretty close on time here, I'm going to move into uh, the concluding comments from each of our, our legislators. Uh, so each of the legis legislators will have two minutes to uh, provide a, a wrap up and probably uh, identify how to get in touch with them if, if anybody um, out there wants to, to do that. Um, and, and keep in mind that uh, this is being rebroadcast on, on a, a public access uh, channel. Um, so there's a, a good chance that somebody is watching this at, at 11 o'clock at night and uh, uh, may want to be uh, uh, reaching out to you at that point. So I'm going to start on, on my left this time uh, as opposed to my right. So start out with Senator Kristen Morris. 
Mike back on. Thank you for having us. It's been great to have a chance to talk to people. I know we've tried to schedule some other legislative forums with other different things, and it's always difficult to uh, get schedules to work out. I'm glad that you guys braved the storm a little bit today and before the snow gets too heavy. So um, first thing, I always can reach me at krars at nd.gov. Um, you can find my Facebook page, has all kinds of contact info on there. And I actually really do enjoy getting emails and getting uh, text messages from constituents. It helps me to understand the context of different bills. There, I can read the bill and I can read the words and apply my own uh, history background and information, but when I hear from other people about how this will affect their lives, what, what they see as being either the benefits or the issues with any bill, it really does help us to understand the context a lot better. So please do not hesitate to reach out in any way. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Roars. Uh, next is Senator Sorbach. Yeah, well, thank you again, and I uh, appreciate it. And I hope you realize from the discussion, we're just a little past crossover. And the real important stuff, and I shouldn't say they're all important, but the more controversial, the more stuff's going to be discussed, and you can hear as the conversation, we've got a lot of work to do. We've got a good system with two chambers. It, it really ends up with good legislation at the end of the day. Sometimes it's chaos, but we've got a lot of work to do. And uh, so it's exciting, and I think we're going to end up with some pretty good product for the citizens. We're going to end up good for K-12, I think. The DPI budget went out of the Senate at $2.5 billion. Now that's everything, so... Uh, we are making a commitment to education, and we're making commitments to a lot of things. So, and if you want to get a hold of me, it's rsorbog at nd.gov, but my cell number's on the website with my email, and I love to hear from people because that's who we represent. So thank you again. Senator Sorbrock, I'm going to follow up on that. Uh, you, you mentioned that we're just past crossover, uh, and many of the people in the room may understand what that means, but um, do you mind giving us a short rundown of what I'll give you a real short. Uh, the House has their bills, the Senate has theirs. At crossover, everything the House passes comes to the Senate, which I think was 359 bills. And everything the Senate passes the first half has to go to the We have to be done with our first half. And I think we sent you 269 bills. So there's a lot of work to do with policy. Appropriations, our workload doesn't change. We take half the budgets, they take half the budgets. And then at crossover, we just flipped them. So that's why when Representative Howe and me are talking what we've seen in appropriations, we're just starting hearings. We've probably gotten through about a third or a half of what they worked. And, so, and then they, re, they rotate that every year. So they had a higher ed to start with. The Senate will next by any. But crossover is everything has to be done on your side. And then we work with what's left. So, Thank you, Senator Sorbog. Next is Representative Marshall. Thank you, and I'd like to thank, uh, thank everybody for, uh, for showing up, uh, braving the storm. Um, I enjoy being here. You can, anybody needs to get a hold of me, it's a marshall uh, uh, at uh, nd.gov, and Marshall's a little bit different spelling. It's M-A-R-S-C-H-A-L-L. -L. That's a marshall at nd.gov. Um, yeah, we're we're getting into the second half. I'm looking forward to uh, looking over the Senate bills. Um, senators always have a little different perspective on things, and uh, we always enjoy. <laughs> yep. Uh, uh, we always enjoy uh, going over their bills. Um, this is my second session, so I look forward to uh, the second half and. Uh, and uh, discussing these bills. Thank you, Representative Marshall. Next is uh, Representative Ben Coppola. Uh Well, thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you to the city and the school district and the chamber for hosting. Thank you, Chris, for moderating. And uh, thank all of you for watching. Uh, if you would like to reach me on any issues, you can reach me at bcoppelman at nd.gov. And uh, my cell uh, number is on the website if you'd like to to uh, call or text on, on something. I'm not as uh, active on Facebook as some, but, uh, but those other methods will definitely reach me. Um, in this remainder part of the session, I look forward to uh, um, wrapping up uh, um, various ideas on uh, funding, on uh, t um, tax policy, and certainly on um, um, some issues that, uh, that affect our veterans. Uh, there is a, a study resolution that I sure hope is selected that's going over to the Senate that would study the uh, delivery to veterans of their veteran services and hopefully um, be the beginning of a roadmap to 
um, a prioritization of things that we do for veterans and, and the things that are more or less important to that group um, in, their, in their desires and their needs. Uh, but we sure appreciate them. So uh, we would love to have any of you come out and, and visit us. If you uh, contact us ahead of time, there's even a chance you could sit next to us on the floor. Uh, maybe we'll even let you push the button as long as you push the right one. But uh, uh, thanks again to the, those hosting, and I look forward to uh, speaking to all of you. Thank you, Representative Ben Koppelman. Next is Representative Kim Koppelman. Well, thank you, Chris, and again, uh, I'll echo the thanks that have been uh, expressed by others. Um, it's, uh, it is that time in the session when things are still moving, as has already been said, and uh, we had 105 bills and resolutions in the House Judiciary Committee the first half of the session. I believe the Senate sent us 25, so we are really, my clerk leaned over to me the other day and said, it feels like we're on vacation, so <laughs> we're, we're able to uh, catch our breath a little bit, but uh, soon will come conference committees where there are House and Senate amendments on various bills that we've sent back and forth. Forth. And then the next phase will be, after we've dealt with one another's bills, is talking about those differences. And so there's more to come. Uh, just uh, noting a few things that we'll be dealing with in the Judiciary Committee in the, probably really in the next week and a half. Uh, this week I've scheduled a bill uh, Monday afternoon uh, which would prohibit felons from attaining membership on school boards. That's an interesting topic and it comes to us from one of our reservations where apparently that's been an issue. Um, we're dealing with things like restraining orders, guardianships, parental rights, uh, agreements to provide services to juveniles uh, in tribal court on reservations that are now available to folks that are not on reservations. So a lot of different issues that come before us. Um, one, uh, again, uh, 30,000 foot level uh, point that I just want to make with respect to what our committee, uh, particularly the Judiciary Committee, deals with is over the last few years we've embarked upon an effort that's become known as justice reinvestment where we're looking at overcrowding prisons, looking at locking people up who have primarily drug problems and questioning whether that's the best place uh, for them and whether treatment is better. And we've passed some landmark legislation on that. It's being implemented by the executive branch of government over the last couple of years, and we're following that closely. Uh, this week in the House, we passed two resolutions for studies that will sort of continue along that path. One deals with juvenile justice, and the other deals with reentry. So uh, our juvenile justice system is uh, what we've had in the books has been there a long time, probably needs some attention and for, for reform. And also, what do we do with folks who come out of prison? Most of the people that are in our prisons in North Dakota are coming back. They're going to be our neighbors. And so how do we want them coming back? And, and all that's uh, the discussion about reentry, and it's a very important one to have. Uh, I'll just close with a quote from uh, actually Otto von Bismarck, for whom our capital city in North Dakota is named who said, uh, laws are like sausages. It's best not to watch either being made. So thank you for being sausage inspectors today. Thank you, Representative Kim Koppelman. Next is Representative Schauer. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, sponsors, uh, for being here and making this happen. Um, leaders of the West Fargo School District, thank you all for being here on a rather snowy Saturday, especially Representative Beadle, who sits over there without being able to talk. This has got to be driving him crazy. So uh, <laughs> please, somebody go up to him and talk to him at the end. Uh, this is my first session. This has been very challenging. You have your own personal principles, and then you have the community that you represent, and then you have the people who got you elected. So oftentimes it gets a little bit cloudy on what direction you go, but ultimately you have to go with your heart and your gut and make the best possible decision um, because you feel a little, little bit like a judge because of all these bills that come up and you work hard to try to get the background, but sometimes it can be very confusing. This next week will be interesting. The new revenue forecast will be coming out. Prairie Dog, another hearing there. As we mentioned, ethics bills will be coming. The TR Library, a hearing on that. And the siren, the $200 million siren, for the state radio system for law enforcement is coming as well, and that's an extremely important issue that came through our committee as well. I would encourage everyone to get involved as much as possible because as Representative Koppelman 1 has said in the past, um, it is a citizen legislator. This is not Washington, D.C. I mean, you, you sit there in your little tiny desk, you have no staff, and, you, and, it, and it's up to you. You've got, to, you've got to do the hard work and the hard lifting, especially if you have bills that, that are passionate and close to your heart. Um, the last thing I want to say that I've been surprised that it's a very bipartisan atmosphere. People really work hard together in the committees and, uh, and even on the floor. Every once in a while it raises its head a little bit and there's an awkwardness that goes on and we all have our own personal feelings, but that's been very encouraging. It is not, as I said, Washington, D.C. So it's been a great experience and I thank you for the opportunity.
Thank you, Representative Schaumer. Next is Representative Michael Howe. And I'll, I'll echo what he said. Um, thank you for putting this on and allowing us to uh, be broadcast on television and have a Saturday morning to speak to the people we represent. Uh, there is still a lot of work to do. Uh, if this was a nine-inning baseball game, I think we're probably in the bottom of the fifth inning right now. Uh, let's not hope for a rain out, by the way, too. <laughs> um, and a bill that I was surprised that wasn't uh, one of the questions was the blue laws. Uh, I think they had that hearing uh, at the end of this past week. Uh, that's something I've heard from a lot of West Fargo residents that they would like to be able to uh, shop before noon on Sundays. A, a lot of people attend their church service at 8, 9 o'clock, and then there's those three hours to uh, get moving on projects on a Sunday morning. So I know that will be a, an interesting uh, debate over in the Senate side. It did pass the House in the first half. Uh, I encourage everyone to get a hold of me. You can find my information on the North Dakota Legislative website. My email is a little different. It's mchow at nd.gov. I know some people have tried to get a hold of me, and they don't put that C in there. Uh, so mchow at nd.gov. Uh, I try to respond to every single email. Admittedly, some do uh, become lost in the shuffle, but I do make an effort. As I know, all, all, all my colleagues make every effort to respond to, to all the emails, and that really does does help us out. Uh, as Senator Roar has stated, we're not experts. This isn't our full-time job. The more we can hear from you uh, and your views will help us craft our views and hopefully make legislation that works for everybody. Uh, so thanks again, uh, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity. All right. Thank you, Representative Howe, and thank you to all of our legislators that came out on a, a snowy day. Um, I want to remind everyone that the next legislative forum is April 13th, uh, and that is coming up in, in just over a month. Uh, we do have a rotating uh, group of, of legislators that uh, uh, participate, um, and we thank this group today. Um, several of them may be back again in a month, um, but uh, again, you know how to get in touch with them, and I encourage uh, you as the audience members and, and those on, on television to do so. Um, and we thank the, the Fargo-Moorhead Chamber of Commerce for supporting and sponsoring a, an event like this that allows uh, uh, the citizens of West Fargo uh, to be in touch with their legislators and the legislators really to have contact with the people that, uh, uh, that sent them out to Bismarck. So with that, I'll turn it over to Bernie. Thank you, Chris. Uh, you scared me a little bit when you told me that you and I have been doing this for 10 or 12 years. Uh, you realize that time has gone by. Again, thank you all. Thank all of you for here. Uh, Representative Thomas Beadle did join us shortly after I did the introduction. So, Thomas, uh, you and your wife, it's great to have you with us today. Thank you for coming. A uh, couple of points. The uh, uh, Prairie Dog Bill. Uh, Prairie Dog Bill with regard to municipalities. West Fargo would give the third largest amount of money, $12,450,000. And uh, that's based on the unprecedented growth. The other thing is, is that when we discuss the diversion in West Fargo, there are 963 acres that will flood if we don't have the Fargo diversion that are in the city limits of West Fargo. And in addition to that, there are over 7,000 acres of West Fargo extraterritorial uh, land that floods uh, if, uh, if not protected by the diversion. So there are, there, there are some real benefits to West Fargo. Just trying to make a point. Uh, with regard to our schools, uh, I recently I had the Director of Communications, Melissa Richard, I asked her, I was doing another talk at somewhere else, about what our average student growth is and over the last five years. And so, with all of you wonderful school representatives are here, if my numbers are wrong, we're going to blame Melissa. <laughs> 445 students per year is the average over five years. We've had some 600 years, 600 student years, we've had some 500, and we have 400 plus. So please keep that in mind when you're making all your deliberations. Again, thank you everyone for being with us today. We're delighted uh, that you joined us on this snowy day. Uh, again, to my counterparts, with, uh, working with Mark Lemur and the school district on coordinating this, and obvious Melissa Richards and Helen Russell are our lead people of the city. Jim Parsons from the Chamber, thank you so very much, and, and uh, we thank you all, and, and uh, go home, and remember, the snow's heavy, don't hurt yourself. Thank you. Have a good day.